are back with yet another jury live stream this time. No audio problems. No guests. No, nothing to get in the way between me and you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome yet again to another, I don't know, slightly less than an hour full of horse shit. Uh, my name is Justin Robert Young. Today on the show, we are going to be talking about uh, a lot of really, really cool things. A lot of in-house things, which is uh, really awesome. And and by in-house, I'm going to lead off talking about something that literally was contained in the house that I grew up in, in Davie, Florida. As you know, if you listened to the show last week or listened to any of the other shows that I do, a Night Attack 2, Enjoy the Garden, was released last week. Oh, so seven days ago. Man, it seems like it was longer than that. Seven days ago, Night Attack 2 was released. And... Since then, we hit number one in iTunes comedy, number one in Amazon comedy. And for those of you for whom it still matters, the number one Billboard comedy album for the week, which is cool. To give you a little context, Night Attack 1 only hit number four. And we were thrilled about that. We were super thrilled and honored uh, to hit number one this week. But... I don't want to talk about last week was all the super congratulatory horseshit. Let's dig into why the album was good and specifically the element of the album that comprised of me personally revealing things about myself. There was one track that I even contemplated late into the edit, eliminating, cutting. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have a lot of shame. I, I really don't. I, I very much believe in the live in public philosophy and the more that I put out there, the stronger my positions can be because I will not be hiding behind hypocrisy or dishonesty if I admit my hypocrisy and dishonesty up front. Now, that's a slippery slope because once you decide that you want to share a majority of your life, the decision does not become... What do I share? It rather becomes what do I hide? And you constantly have to redefine what that is. Specifically for me, the only stuff I ever hide is when the information is not mine to reveal. Which made a track on the album, eventually titled Gay or Not Gay, kind of hard because it involved a story that had me interacting with other people in a very embarrassing manner. I mean, I guess it's embarrassing. I don't really find it all that embarrassing. It's certainly an interesting or funny manner to me, but uh, I could understand where other people who are involved in the story wouldn't want it out there. If you have not purchased the album, which, by the way, is available on iTunes and Amazon for only three ninety nine, three sixty nine dollars on Amazon, actually. The track goes uh, as follows. I explained to Brian that uh, once when I was about 13 on a dare, I jerked off next to my friend while watching pornography and uh, was walked in on by uh, his stepfather. Then, maybe a year and a half later, uh, there was more pornography involved and I jerked off next to a friend where we were both in the same room. And then maybe a year and a half after that, I wound up again jerking off to pornography while a friend was in the room. This time it was Showgirls, the Paul Verhoeven classic Showgirls. Now, there are two elements to this. The first is the realization that I had today. I, uh, I realized this week that although the most salacious element of that story is to ask whether or not I'm gay... It's really not 
I mean, it's not true because uh, obviously, and and on some level, if you really wanted to break it down, you could say that I'm trivializing the concept of homosexuality uh, to think that maybe just jerking off next to a friend would make me gay or that this these were gay instincts acting out. Although, when you really break it down, if I had the foresight and temerity to continue to jerk off next to my friends, that kind of enterprising and genius young man, should he have been gay, would have asked to see his friend's dicks, which I didn't. I would like to think if I were a gay young man and I were in those situations that I would have asked to see my friend's dicks. I don't know how I got to that point. Here's my point. This was a story that will never be repeated. Many might say I should have never repeated it verbally, but I don't mean that. I mean that it was a tale of a world without internet pornography. Should I have lived in a world, which I eventually did, all of this happened before I had any kind of computer to look up pornography on. But now, in the world of ubiquitous internet pornography, where you can get fucking the the carnal desire to satiate your weirdest whim at, at the drop of a hat. I don't know why you would be dropping. What a weird contest that would be. Uh, let me take off my hat and drop it on the floor and then everybody go find Japanese tentacle porn. Um, although it does sound like I would not be shocked if somebody told me that that was like a, uh, a <laughs> some sort of San Francisco tradition. Oh, don't worry. Go down to Soma. They do the hat drop jerk off. It's happened since 1943. Uh, if I lived in a world during this, the tale, the telling of this story or, or when the, the source material comes from, I don't think I would have jerked off next to my friends. This was the only time that I got to see pornography. It was, it was like we had a stargate. And fucking the Stargate just didn't open everywhere. Every once in a while, it was like a fucking process. And we had to lie to people to get it. We had to steal it from people. And next thing you know, it's like, I am not going to get a chance to look at pornography and jerk off. Moving pornography. Sure, like pictures and stuff, sure. But video pornography? Oh, oh. The sweetest. The sweetest. In the Song of Ice and Fire books, they discuss Dornish wine as the finest. Arbor Gold is the finest wine in all of Westeros. Mwah! This was the Arbor Gold of, of teenage sexual experiences for me. Oh, oh, so sweet. And it didn't exist anywhere else. And that is the story of gay or not gay. Not whether or not I, I was or was not gay, although easily... That's funnier. Now, the other funny element of gay or not gay is this week when we hit number one on Billboard, I wrote on Facebook, look, mom, I'm number one. I have a number one comedy album on Billboard and then posted the picture and then said below it. Also, mom, never listen to the album. Now understand that my mom is fairly active on Facebook, as is a certain level of my family, a, a thin social slice of my family, mostly the women, my aunt, aunts, you know, stuff like that. They are also pretty uh, up there on Facebook. So all of a sudden today, I got the following post on my wall, on Facebook, publicly, on my wall. Okay, this is from my mom, Gloria Anzalone. Okay, so I couldn't resist the temptation. I downloaded the Night Attack 2 album and listened to Gay Not Gay. Thought it was hilarious and incredibly courageous. You never cease to amaze me. Love the, uh, the, love the few other skits that I've been able to listen to as well. You and Brian got it all going on. Congratulations once again. Followed by a comment from my aunt in Brazil. I enjoyed it as well. So funny. Now, 
Two thoughts come to mind immediately. Number one, it is always a pleasure. And, and you have to understand this, that my, uh, my mom, me and my brother and my mom are, are very close. We're not uh, like talk to each other every day close, but on a, on a, a more primal level because my mom divorced my dad and it was really just the three of us for, uh, you know, a very long time. And, and, you know, it was a very survival instinct, especially in the first couple of years. She is the inspiration for everything that I do and the strongest person I've ever known. So it is delightful to me, incredibly ingratiating that something that is a personal project when it achieves success to hear my mom praise it just brings me glee to, to no end. Secondarily, can you text me that, mom? Do you, do you have to put that publicly on my Facebook page? Do you really fucking Jesus Christ? Do you have to tell everybody, alert the entire family? Cause now it's going to be on fucking my Aunt Sue's Facebook page, my Aunt Beverly's Facebook page. Now every everybody's going to be downloading Night Attack 2, enjoy the garden and listening to every sordid, filthy fucking detail that I decided to put on that album. Oh, Jesus. Just text me. Jesus fucking Christ, mother. You don't need to put that out there. This is a social network, okay? We don't, uh, jeez. So anyway, there we go. Uh, thanks. Thank you very, very much, mom. Uh, I really, uh, really, really do appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give a huge shout out right now to one of Diamond Club's own, Chat Realm's own, a man who does a lot for NSFW show and, and pretty much everything else that we have inside this devilish little community of ours. The Dark Wizard, Dan Dirks, his creation, strawpole.me, has experienced just insane traffic over the last month. Over a million uniques uh, for... For straw poll, largely because it's become a staple amongst a lot of Twitch communities. Now, Twitch, for those of you who don't know, is the rebranded gaming version of what you are watching right now. If you are on Justin TV or if you would like to watch live, we go live on Saturday uh, afternoons, Pacific time. Follow me at Justin R. Young. And if you do, you will click on a link that is justin.tv slash Justin Robert Young and that's basically the same engine that they use for Twitch. However, there's a lot of really diehard communities for guys like Man vs. Game, who's been on an NSFW show and is an awesome dude. He, uh, you know, is live every single night playing through these games and just kind of building a huge, massive, awesome community. And a lot of those guys, I don't know if Man vs. Game specifically, but a lot of those kind of guys have taken to uh, strawpole.me. Let me tell you something about Dan Dirks. This dude is insanely fucking talented. Me and Andrew uh, worked with him on a couple projects and like there's nothing that he can't do. I mean, like you have to understand when you work with Andrew and Andrew is sketching out your grand plans of things to do. That's that's a wide ranging, demanding uh, brain to take orders from. And Dan always did it without missing a beat. What he's built with strawpole.me is something so simple, but functional. It's everything you've ever wanted in like an instant poll sort of thing, uh, where they're always just so annoying to, to make and create and embed. This just does everything. If Dan Dirks is not hired by a company I mean, if Strawpole.me isn't bought and then he goes to work for that company by the end of this year, there ain't a fucking God. There ain't a Jesus. And of course, there isn't a God or a Jesus. But I mean, like there's it will be proof, not that we live in an unfair universe, but rather that people are fucking retarded and can't see talent when it is spitting in their face. So everybody go ahead and give a real big hat tip to Dan Dirks. And let me also point this out. If you are listening to this show, there is a high likelihood that you follow some of our other podcasts and you would either are a part of our kind of hashtag chat realm or Diamond Club communities, the guys that hang out, you know, go into Google Hangouts at night, shoot the shit. If you just follow hashtag chat realm uh, on Twitter, it's a great way to kind of keep up with everybody. 
But I will guarantee you that the spores that blew into twitch.tv bringing strawpole.me were probably chat roamers. The same way the spores that brought it to Twit, because now it's like the preferred way that Twit does uh, polls. This is what is great about this community, is that if there is something of value, everybody wants to spread it, and they want to spread it far and wide, and they're happy for the success of the person that created it. So thank you to everybody that spread the word on strawpoll.me. Thank you to Dan Dirks for being a beautiful human being and fucking creating such an amazing product. And fuck you to anybody who fucking looks at strawpoll.me and doesn't hire Dan immediately if you are in the position to. Because it is at your motherfucking peril that you don't. Strawpoll.me is an unsolicited plug for strawpoll.me. I have to uh, eat my own balls. I got to eat them. I'm going to eat my own balls right now in front of everybody. Uh, I, I said before, I guess the theme of this episode is honesty and transparency. And I would like to, uh, make some honest and transparent remarks right now. And that's this ladies and gentlemen, I was wrong, loud, wrong, big, wrong, Flashing neon lights, W-O-R-N-G, motherfucker, which I don't know why there is a sign that says wrong, motherfucker, but it, it exists and it is flashing in my face. You know who was right? Brian Brushwood. Brian Brushwood was right. I was wrong. Many other people were right. I was wrong. I very much believed, and there's a bit of a caveat, because I think I'm, I'm right in the moment, but I'm wrong long term. Here is what I'm talking about. When Netflix released House of Cards, I wouldn't say that I said it was a mistake that they were dumping all of them at once, although they really just do need a better term than dumping. Because, like, I heard that, I think Sarah Lane said it on Tech News Today about, you know, that Netflix Netflix dumps all the House of Cards and dumps all the Hemlock Grove and will dump Arrested Development. Bad term, but apparently it's sticky. Forget that I put dump and sticky in the same sentence as well. I thought that it was short-sighted. I thought that a company that has a history of betting big on their hunches and not being afraid to strike out might have struck out again because they... I looked at House of Cards in comparison to The Americans. Number one, I'll say this. I very much enjoy weekly episodic television and being able to discuss the the minutia of each hour of television with my friends uh, as they come out, I have enjoyed immensely this week discussing the most recent ho- or Game of Thrones episode with all my other friends and family who really enjoy Game of Thrones because it was a great episode. And I love being able to go through like literally every little teeny bit about what was good and what was bad and, and the little changes to the books with my friends who have already read them. You're not going to get that with House of Cards because everyone's going to watch it on their own schedule. And the majority of the time when you say, oh, have you seen House of Cards? The answer is either going to be yes, no, or I'm in the middle of it. And in the middle of it, you're always going to be on different uh, episodes. Now, not to say that doesn't happen now, but there is a greater group of people who move at the same path. At the same pace, rather. On the same path. The path and the pace. Pace and the path. But I think I'm wrong. I think I'm just a slave to a bygone era. I think that this is just my, you know, I I prefer vinyl because you can really hear the scratches and pops. It's like, well, no. I mean, like, you might have good feelings about scratches and pops, but scratches and pops fucking don't actually sound good to people. They're just unnecessary. To people who didn't grow up with vinyl, that sounds like a shitty recording. You know, super high fidelity audio is is what they would prefer on a technical level. So 
I think I was just kind of a, a slave to it. And here's what made me realize it. Netflix had a huge, gigantic quarter. Because my thought was that you're going to get more people to subscribe to your service if you do the HBO model. You release the episode one week at a time. And each week, as everybody is discussing the episode, it's also a subtle reminder. Hey, get the subscription service. Get Netflix. Now, they had a huge quarter. Massive, massive, massive gains. They've overperformed. Now, how long ago does Quickster sound like? When everybody was shitting on Netflix and thinking that they were, you know, had one foot in the grave. Now, it's off the, you know, off the heels of a massive look at us coming out party hit like uh, House of Cards. They got Hemlock Grove, which apparently, according to their metrics, was watched more in the first week than House of Cards was. And they have, with by all arguments, the biggest possible, uh, you know, release, Arrested Development, which is going to garner nothing but huge, awesome, amazing uh, press for them. Of which the first deleted scenes from the new uh, the new season came out this week, including uh, Buster and Lucille, which. Man, I hope it's good. I hope it's good. The clip is funny. Hope it's good. But here's the realization I had. And it's a prediction as well. I know that Netflix does not want to play the how many people watched this show inside a season game. Because they'll lose that right now. Right now, more people will watch an average show during a season on broadcast television than will watch the season inside, let's say, the 12-week window that it would have been released. Um, we'll, or we'll watch House of Cards over that 12-week window. But what Netflix is banking on, and they've said as much, is it's not about the week game to them. It's not about the 12-week game. It may not even be about the year game. It's about the five-year game. That more people will watch House of Cards in five years over the course of five years. More people will watch the first season of House of Cards over the course of five years than will watch a Breaking Bad or a Mad Men, a certain season of that show. Now, what's also interesting is I had a a premonition that a year from now, not officially, but leaked, we would get numbers from Netflix. What we all really want. How many people have watched this show? And I, my, my premonition was at the first available point in which it seems positive for them to throw their numbers up against a big popular show that people consider a hit. And my guess was that they would compare it to something like Breaking Bad or Mad Men. So I looked through the ratings for Breaking Bad and Mad Men, and I found a very interesting trend. Normally what happens with super, super, super serialized shows, serialized, of course, meaning that it's one story that unfolds over many chapters, as opposed to, you know, a bunch of standalone episodes involving the same characters with some basic underlying uh, serialization underneath. What normally happens with serialized shows is they start big and then contract because people stop watching or, you know, fall off or lose, you know, the the thread and just, you know, like, ah, eventually I'll catch up on it. But their live numbers, their, their premiere numbers shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. Not the case for Mad Men and Breaking Bad. Mad Men and Breaking Bad. Mad Men, I guess, had a slight, they kind of stayed flat on their season premiere this year. But they have increased since their first season, year after year. Now, it also bears mentioning that these shows are very Netflix friendly. It's very easy for you to see all the back episodes of these shows as they come close. And like for Mad Men, Mad Men premiered their new season and then debuted the previous season on Netflix. So you can... 
bang out that last season and then come back to watching it live. They, the way that these shows are existing is completely changing how we think about television success, which is why Netflix is smarter than me. And I was wrong. Big, fat, loud, wrong. Netflix is doing the right thing. And it turns out they know how to run their business better than some fucking idiot who yammers on the internet for the delight of everybody else who is listening here. Dance. 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 A gummy scratch beat. Let's go. Dance. I like to dance. I like to dance. I wanna dance. I need to dance, baby. Wanna dance? Twenty fourteen's on this mind. Uh -huh. We about to do this right. All right, now's the time where we go through. The mail. If you would like to email me, it is justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Make sure you put J-U-R-Y in the subject line. This one comes from Alex. I would really, uh, I would really enjoy to hear an interview between you and Andy and Notco about the creative writing process or whatever you want to talk about. I realize he's done other interviews and that certain topics are off limits, but I would love to see him within the NSFW show realm. Keep up the good work. Um, I would love to talk to Andy Naco about a lot of things. Um, you know, obviously he's a he's a print guy, he's a print journalism guy, and and I have a soft spot in my heart for for print journalism guys because that is where I came from in a former life. Christ, I was educated in. I didn't really come from it. I always feel guilty about saying that I was a print journalist. I worked for like two papers. This is like not really a thing. But what would I like to talk to Andy Nako about? I mean, I guess if I could talk to, to Andy, the biggest thing that I would wonder is that when you look at like sports journalism, the biggest problem is that the people who make their living covering sports start to hate sports. And I would wonder if there's ever been a point where he started to hate tech, you know, if there was ever maybe the, uh, a period of time in which the innovations kind of really weren't where they wanted to be, or the dominant stories were really stupid and annoying, uh, you know, because like now we're in a period where like it's tech isn't as fun to talk about as it was Three years ago, I think, you know, and it's largely because post iPad, you know, Apple is not Apple created amazing talking points for or against, you know, they were an undeniably talented company, an undeniably successful company, an undeniably revolutionary company that also annoyed the fuck out of people that provides amazing fodder to talk about. And even as somebody who is covering tech or reviewing technology, that imbues everything. Now, you know, I don't think it's it's controversial to say that Apple is in a slightly more stagnant place than it was before. Um, hopefully, that comes to an end when they release their next kind of big product, be it a television or a watch or a can opener. But the next time they bet big, whether or not it's successful or not, that will be an interesting thing to talk about. But if they fail, it will also be kind of like, well, there we go. We know what was going to happen. Part of what made the Apple story so compelling was that we expected gravity to take it so many times. And it just continued to defy the expectations. So I would ask that. I would ask whether or not he's ever become sick of covering tech. And then also, you know, he's a guy who is very, very much uh, of the, the geek sphere. And I think geek culture is a fascinating topic because geek culture is something different these days. You know, geek culture is culture. And you got to wonder, you know, there's a lot of people who kind of resent that. And I'm always just curious about that point of view. And I think he'd be a great person to talk to. So, uh, yeah, you know, I'll tell you what, I would love to, uh, I'm going to start setting up these interviews because uh, this is going to be a podcast that I need to have come out every week. And some weeks I can't do it. I would love to have an interview in the can. 
And uh, so there we go. If you have anybody else that you would like to hear me interview, go ahead and hit me up. J-U-R-Y in the subject line, Justin Robert Young at gmail.com is the place to do it. All right. Everybody get your topics ready. I'm going to do a little potpourri, ladies and gentlemen. I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about coming up right now. This is officially your trying to come up with topics for me to talk about music. All right, here we go. Coming in right now into the Justin.TV chat room. Of course, you can watch us record live every Saturday or when we do record Saturday. Just go ahead and follow Justin R. Young on Twitter if you would like to know when that is happening. For those that are here now, I now bring you these random topics. I remind you, as I do every week, that I do not have access to what these topics are as they are generated live. We begin with Leon1337. Where's Who's the Boss? Well, Who's the Boss fans, do I have good news for you? We are going to be recording pretty much the entire season. Because of schedules and stuff, we have not been able to actually sit down. That's a lie. We did record an episode right after the mid-season premiere. I unfortunately deleted it because I'm a fucking idiot. Patrick Delahenty is going to come on down to Oakland. We're going to watch the latest episode, record that one live so everybody can watch it. And then... Uh, record the season premiere one again, and then we're going to go through each episode between today and tomorrow, me and Ashley, and as much as Patrick wants to hang out for, and uh, we're going to bang out all of our thoughts on this season of Doctor Who. Let me just say this. kind of dig it. I really dig it. I think it's been a, a, an enjoyable season so far, but that is not a universally held opinion. In fact, you might say there's a bit of a role reversal on the podcast for this half season. We will get to that when we record it. Black Panda, when are we getting Ruinum? Big news on the Ruinum front. Uh, the formula has been approved by the government. So we are maybe about... I know I'm going to get myself in trouble by giving a date, but I would say two weeks away from a pre-sale. And then about, uh, I think they said late June for shipping uh, because it takes a little bit of time for them to get everything together. So um, suggested retail price, I believe, will probably be close to 17 to $20 a bottle. That will be about what Ruinum costs. Um, that is, you know, once you factor in shipping, I mean, that's like including shipping, I believe. So we're looking at about 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, and I'll guarantee you this, man. You ain't going to need a whole bottle to fucking have a good night. You'll be able to sip on that motherfucker for a little bit uh, and, and have yourself. That'll last you. That's 20% alcohol by volume. You can go ahead and keep that one on the shelf for a little bit. Sip on Grandpa's old cough syrup. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and recommend that you do that. Do not take down an entire bottle by yourself. Uh, Holotape. Diamond Club t-shirts ever. Uh, And let's work in some non-Diamond Club housekeeping stuff. Uh, Diamond Club t-shirts. There will be a exclusive Frog Pants meets Diamond Club uh, solidarity shirt that will be sold in honor of Nerdtacular. That'll probably be the next Diamond Club t-shirt. And, uh, you know, we're working with this new company that, you know, maybe it would uh, make sense if we actually just had a permanent kind of home for a Diamond Club t-shirt. Uh, but that's in the future. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Theater monkey, what do you consider success? That's a fun, that's a fun question. Success to me is a personal feeling. Uh, I tend to have a habit of discounting success. Uh, I want, I'm like a a dog chasing a car. Uh, All I want is success, success, success until I get it. And that, and immediately I find it worthless. Uh, So I think success to me is the, the ever elusive dream. You know, 
what you want to do is is never give yourself credit and just keep working and working and working. And then at some point you look back behind you and you realize how far you've climbed up the mountain. And that is the good feeling of gratitude that like, oh, man, I guess I did do something. That's pretty sweet. But success is a dangerous idea. For me, success means taking your foot off the gas. And, and that's when I'm at my most dangerous to myself is when I think I've done something and then I you know stop uh, working as hard. Tensor guy, did you play Bioshock Infinite? No, because I have a fucking roommate who's been dominating the Xbox with Skyrim. So hopefully when the Skyrim fucking subsides, then I will have some Xbox time to play Bioshock Infinite. Uh, also, I'm kind of putting myself on a little bit of a budget because I get hit with a fucking massive tax liability. So uh, I'm waiting until I can kind of replenish. And there's a couple things coming in uh, that will hopefully get me back on good financial footing and I'll feel comfortable about buying things like video games. Uh, all right. Can we get a new weird things podcast soon? Yes. Yes. You will get a new weird things podcast soon. Uh, again, a big schedule thing and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, to put the pieces together. Uh, I think it's going to be hard for us to get the whole band together for the foreseeable future. Uh, but we'll talk more on that uh, when we uh, when we come to do the podcast. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that about wraps it up for this edition of the jury live stream. If you would like to send us an email, it is Justin Robert Young at Gmail dot com. You can go ahead and hit me up on Twitter. Justin R. Young. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, do me a favor and please. Don't die. All right. Bonus content. Someone just said here in the chat room, what would Brian say if someone were to scan his book test and put it online for free? Uh, I can't speak for Brian. I'll tell you what. It sounds like he just went live. You can go ahead and ask him yourself. I'll tell you what I would say. Now, that's kind of fucked up. But then again, I say that about everything. I've never been the justified piracy guy. Uh, I feel like, yeah, it happens. If you do it, I don't think you're the worst person in the world. In the same way, I don't think people who fucking you know, uh, get debilitatingly drunk around their kids. I think it's fucked up. I wouldn't do it. I don't recommend it to everybody, but you know, listen, we all got our demons. I'm not saying that you are a terrible person for bit torrenting stuff. I'm just saying that you shouldn't fucking think that you're a change agent. You shouldn't think that you are this fucking great person who's moving the world forward or people are forcing you to pirate stuff. If you pirate stuff, just know that you're fucking doing something that probably ain't the coolest thing in the world. That's my only point about piracy. And if some shit happened where, like, and it happened with Andrew. Andrew's shit is all online. His magic DVDs are fucking, like, you know, bit torrented fucking constantly. They're, they're usually, they rank among the highest, uh, most downloaded magic DVDs, bit torrented magic DVDs in the world. However, there ain't a whole lot you can do about it except for just kind of thinking, well, that's sort of fucked up. I really don't cotton to that. But, if it happened to Brian, I would think the same thing that I think when it happens to everybody else. Dude, kind of fucked up. All right. That ends, Jerry. Bye. See, Mr. Bob McBob, Brian is a little guy. So if you have any pirating morals, do it to multi-billion dollar corporations. I don't see that line. I really fucking don't. Like, I, I, I don't. I don't justify it like that. It's just, if you're taking, then you're taking like, this isn't about who you are taking from. It is about your action to take. So it's like, if you take from Warner brothers or you take from Andrew Maine, like it, to me, you're still making the same motion to do it. And again, I'm not trying to demonize. I'm just saying that I don't feel like you should feel like you are Robin hood. You know, you're just a guy who steals shit. Um, so there we go. All right. Mm, wait, hold on. Someone said, what, if, what would you say if I got a Max Trollbot tattoo? Uh, number one, I don't recommend anybody, uh, put anything on their body, but if you are going to do, do it. Like I don't have a tattoo. I will not have a tattoo because, uh, even though I'm not Jewish, I, I kind of want to keep the options open about getting put into a Jewish cemetery. Uh, but if you do and you get a Max Trollbot tattoo, I would really like to see it because that would be very, very funny to me. 
Uh, if anybody gets a fucking Diamond Club tramp stamp, that would maybe be the best thing ever. If just because of the possibility that one day the girl who gets the Diamond Club tramp stamp would be having sex with somebody for the first time, doggy style, and they'd be like, oh, you like NSFW too? That would maybe be the, my favorite thing ever in the world. Um, all right. There we go. I love you guys. I'm going to stop. I have a fucking splitting headache from getting off the plane this morning. Uh, oh, also, new Young Roundsville probably coming out today. And stay tuned to the Justin Robert Young YouTube channel. Some stuff coming out on the Justin Robert Young YouTube channel. See you later.